Uh, hi, I'm Jesse Fuchs. I teach here, uh, and it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Friedman Fries. Uh, Friedman Fries is a uh, board game designer who started, I believe, in the early mid '90s. Uh, whose first uh, major big hit is the game Power Grid, that I think many of you would be familiar with. Uh, fantastic game, and uh, he is one of my favorite game designers, and a large part of that is because I tremendously admire his career arc, which is that he made some games, and then he made a big hit game that is incredibly solid, and everyone likes, and everyone says, yes, this is a very good game, and then he said, now you trust me, I'm going to get weird. <laughs> and everything he's made since then is fantastically interesting and hitting fantastically innovative game design things. And I think the highest compliment I can give someone is that his misses are more interesting than most people's hits to me. Um, among his games, there's 504, which I use in modern tabletop literacy, which he'll be uh, hopefully talking about, which is an immense achievement. Uh, the recent Fast Forward series, which is a very interesting twist on legacy games. Uh, a series of party games, America. Uh, fauna uh, that are about uh, making uh, the skill for answering trivia questions a little more accessible to a lot of people. So really hitting a tremendous variety of game designs, each of which has enormously innovative uh, ideas behind it. The other thing that fascinates me and that I really, really am looking forward to this talk about is teaching here a lot of my students have excellent digital prototyping skills uh, and are interested in making non-digital games. We haven't quite, there's no textbook. There's no way that we found to really fit these things together. And I think I'm going to be taking extensive notes on this talk and watching it over and over so that I can actually help my students more. And with that, I'd like to welcome Friedman Fries. Yeah, it's just me. It's just like, it sounds uh, <laughs> always uh, awkward to see. Okay, I make it 25 years now, and yeah, just like maybe <laughs> some, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think I have to disappoint you. I, uh, <laughs> the problem is I do not story tell. I, yeah, I just do not story tell, and my practice is theory. This is very uh, difficult because theory, I use theory for inspiration techniques. So uh, we'll see if this fits. <laughs> uh, Jesse said something about the, uh, my, my uh, most successful game, which is Power Grid. Power Grid has a theme. It, it is not doing a story to tell. You're just an owner of power plants, and you want to earn money, and you go buy resources, and you build a network. And in the end, somebody has won. There's no story in it. It's just like growing companies uh, compete with each other. It's a strong theme. The nearest thing I had in my history is, uh, of storytelling is Funny Friends. It is just about, yeah, living from uh, puberty to the 30s. Of course, there's sex, there's drugs, there's religion. So it is an... Uh, an open idea of sexual thing. It is no, there's no judgment on sex having with whoever you want. It's just homosexual in there. Drug use, something like that. So it's my, my point of view on living, not the conservative point of view on living. Somebody told me, played, oh, they played Game of Life and said, Game of Life should have some, <laughs> some of these events you have in your game. Because these events in my game are not the Game of Life in Ben. Yeah, there are some drunken, drinking things and yeah. So yeah. <laughs> But it is still not storytelling. It is just creating structure. It's just like I create a structure of story can happen, theme can happen in between, and not a story to tell. I'm not, not a good, good writer of stories. Um, because I, I create structures. I create physical structures in the physical world. I am not, I use computers for my work, but my goal is to have something in my hand, physical card, cards, yeah, blocks, whatever. And the structures I, I do create has to be neutral. I offer decisions. And they are weaker decisions and better decisions. And yeah, <laughs> when you take the weak decision, you, you take the weak decisions. The system itself does not judge it. You do not win. But you're still in the system. You're not thrown out of the system. Yeah, play elimination, OK, something else. Yeah, but this is game-wise. But it is just very interesting. I just create a, a neutral structure that reacts. You put something in, you get something out. 
And this is also my inspirational project to see. If I go there and do this theory, this is practice to me because, oh, this input output thing. Do I want to have a structure where the same input always gets the same output or not? Do I want to have, this is design decisions already. So thinking about my theory gives me inspiration for my structures I want to create. But I'm in the physical world, and the one thing I need is crafting tools. And I have, this is not a weapon. It was, I'm coming from Germany, it is not that easy. <laughs> no, it was my suitcase, not my handbag. I just want to have you that you have something to feel what I'm doing. That, just give it around, that to feel. <laughs> I want to have it back, it was expensive. Um, <laughs> it is my cardboard scissors. This is not the paper scissors, this is a cardboard scissors. You can tear apart almost everything with that. <laughs> yeah, so you have a thick, card a thick cardboard, you have a board game, you just cut it down and you have the board in half, you have tiling, you can, this is, yeah, something to work with. But on the other end, I also use material. This is the weak theme here is tools. And I've thought about, yeah, tools, material, sometimes tools are material. I could use the scissors as a part of a game, then, then it's material and not a tool anymore. So it was just like when I'm thinking of what it is, uh, is it material or is it a tool? And I thought, I don't mind for this speech here, I just, maybe I mix it up, maybe it's uh, confusing, but. So I look at these material and see something. On uh, the left-hand side, there is some glass, wood, stone, wooden blocks. But on the right-hand side, there's also structured material, good for inspiration. There are dice, there are drawing bags. It all, in that very moment, you see that you have an idea what to do with it. This is material, as I said, it is my practice to look at all the stuff that inspires me to my work. Can I use a 12-sided die as a six-sided die? In, in, a, in a video game, computer game, you just say uh, random 10, random 12, random 15. You don't need these uh, physical objects. I have this, only these physical objects. Or I create a drawing bag when I want to have these special randomness in there. I could only, would only create in a video game, so I can do that. And, of course, the dice and the drawing back, mathematically seen, the dice is memoryless, and the drawing back, there's some memory because what's out, it's out, and what's in, it's still in. So it's like a deck of cards where you draw something from. Uh, so the deck of cards is very similar to a drawing back in structuralized, but not in feel. So just like this already leads me to my design decisions. What to, so now, back from the physical stuff to the theoretic stuff. I, um, I had studied math medications. Uh, somebody uh, yesterday asked me for, you know, we had a discussion about a deck of cards of 60 cards, and I asked uh, what's better, this cards 50 or 60 cards. There are 60 cards, because 60 cards I can distribute by two to six players. Because I am not a video game maker, so I look for turn-based multiplayer games. I made two solo games, okay, but normally in my day work, it is all about multiplayer things and turn-based. Of course, there can be fast things, fast decision games, something like that. So, of course, so now back to the numbers. I need as tools and maybe the uh, and number, I need a tool, and numbers make a structure. Uh, the 60 is dividable. We have, we see there, the Heron Tort Tortoise race card. Heron Tortoise is a game, it, was the, it won the first game of the year, Spiel des Jahres Award in 1979. And it works like a race game where you, as, when you get, if you go one step, you have to pay one carrot. If you go two steps, you have to pay three. three. If you go three, you have to pay six. So the next step costs you four. Uh, the next step costs you five. So you see these uh, triangle numbers on the chart, which is one, three, 
6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36. You can calculate it by n times n minus 1 but divided by 2, whatever it, it comes from. Uh, it is in the Pascalian triangle in there, these numbers, and so on. But it is the easiest way to make things more expensive because I have to work with integers. I cannot, I cannot say, okay, you get 1.1 and have to pay a half carat. There's a carat, there's a carat on there. You cannot pay a half carat. So I'm, I'm absolutely limited to that numbers. And this is the easiest chart of things to make things more expensive. Because the, this structure in that Heron Tortoise game already creates the idea, okay, I want to have, I have these 50 carats. And where can I go in three turns? So I have to look at the chart, and, and I see, okay, I can go now nine spaces, and then I have only five carats left, so I can go only one and two next, so I will go 12 spaces, and so you have already this in there, then you have a board also structured with events, so this is the game. You think of oh, how many carats I need, and how far, because I want to be, it's a race game, the less turns I need, the more probable I win, okay. Other thing with numbers is, it's my favorite <laughs> number problem. This is the dice there, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. The problem with the dice and the problem from one to two is we double what the outcome. After that, only 1.5, only 1.33, 1.25. So the one is so absolutely far off. And nobody sees it. it's natural. Everybody see, ah, yeah, dice must be one, two, three, four, five, six. But it's horrible. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. If you roll a five or a six, it doesn't matter the difference. Yeah. But a one or a two, it is horrible. It is half the, the value we get. Yeah. And this is just an abstraction I see. And when I make victory point chips, I see games where people make victory point chips from one and two. It is no, make two and three. Yeah. When you get victory point chips, make two and three and don't make one and two. Because, yeah, then somebody's, even in the kids' game, kids realize that. They're not dumb. They're, they're not educated now, but they're not dumb. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's just like, they will see it, they will feel it, that this is unfair. Oh, I have five chips. The other one, oh, I have three chips, I won. Uh, what? <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah? It's just like... Why make it randomly in with victory point chips? Yeah, because information, something hidden, more interesting, not to see who's leading, something like that. If you have a, a track in a kid's game, it's just like, oh, yeah, the kid is behind and yeah. <laughs> Does he really wants to play with me anymore <laughs> if there's a track? No, the chips are better, yeah? So just like, it's very interesting. Very interesting thing I found out for business games, Catan, Power Grid, my 504, unconditional base income works. Surprise. <laughs> In capitalism, <laughs> to add it up, because this is the same. If I get zero base income and somebody gets something, then it more than doubles. <laughs> but if I only have one and the other person gets two, it's horrible. So in Settlers of Catan, in Catan, you get, you start your game with two settlements and not with one settlement. Because you get a base income and whoever gets a third settlement only gets a one and a half better and not double better. So it is very important. In power grid, even if you don't supply any power to the cities, you get 10. It is absolute UBI. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's socialism. Yeah. <laughs> It is just to get it, yeah? But the people still play it. And they are ambitious about playing it. And they're competing. A lot of people say, oh, if you give the people that money, they will not compete anymore. And capitalism is breaking down. I have not seen it. <laughs> yeah? Just like, yeah? <laughs> in 504, it's the same. You have a base income of 20. I just put it in because 504 is a game where you construct. You have nine different modules. You take three out of them, bring them in order, and this is mathematically nine times eight times seven, 504 different games this game box generates. And therefore, I need something stable in there. And the base income is that I can work on that. So I have the base income, this is 
very good that every game has these 20 base income for everybody. So we have this uh, number problem. Francis Tresham, very early on in the right -hand corner, these are the cards from Civilization. Francis Tresham made early. It's not the Sid Meier's Civilization. We're talking about Francis Tresham's Civilization. Um, you get cards. When you have one city, you get one card. When you have two cities, you get two cards, and so on. But if you have two cards, you get a one and a two. If you have three cards, you get a one, two, and a three, up to nine. So the ones are stinkers, we know. The twos are OK. <laughs> But what did he there? It was very, very interesting. Uh, on the three, it might be seen that there is a number 3, 12, 27, 48, 75, up to 2, 4, 3. It is just that you get a lot more when you have a lot more cards. Because you get the square of the number times the number. So it means that you can have a lot of low cards, but it add up to a very big number because the low cards are easier to get. So this is the yeah, valuation trick in game design. To say, okay, the big cards are big cards, fine. But they are so rare that I cannot can combine, combine them. And, and of course, he made another trick. It's the one since the twos are two colored. So you have to trade. It's a game about negotiation trading. So it's a, trading, it's a trick to yeah, force the players to trade. So this is the arithmetic part. Yeah, of, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I just put these things all together and there's so many and so many and so many and just focused on what yeah, came into my mind. Next part in mathematics is topology. Um, we have, sorry to say, we have only have three times of grids. <laughs> we have a square grid, we have a triangle grid, and we have a hex grid. And there's nothing more. You cannot fill, you have not a pattern filling with uh, pentagons. There's not matching. There's a Cairo pattern tiling, but these pentagons build uh, a hex structure. Yeah? And you see there's chess, there's go, they're using the square thing. Interestingly, chess uses the spaces, and go uses the knots, the intersections. And they both still are square patterns. Catan uses a hex grid, but this is not a hex grid. It's a triangle grid because they use the not the intersection of singularities. So it is only, you only have three, because on the intersection of three hexes, you only have three neighbors. And my first Funkenschlag, which is the base for power grid, uses a triangle set, this is a bit difficult to see, and, but all steps have three neighbors, uh, six neighbors, but it's a triangle grid. So the triangle grid and the hex grid are almost the same. So structuralized, I only have two. <laughs> it's a bit sad, <laughs> but uh, we can do something like that, and Eric always see that. He thought, <laughs> this was fine today, I have these monkeys, and you can do this, everybody knows, yeah. But the problem is, the monkeys are... And they built a pattern. There's a tiling for these monkeys. Oh, somebody stole a monkey. Oh, no. <laughs> there it is. So, and surprisingly, what you see is a hex. Yeah. So, patterns work like that. Whatever you do, you normally fall into a hex or square pattern. Or you make it like risk. You have a natural board, you design a board. That is something I, I, I need to know. It is just like, as I, I started Power Grid with these grid building, I crayon on the board and build the grid. And for the version 2004, I just changed the board into a graph. A graph has not that problem. The graph is just dots with lines. and You can do whatever you like. You are not forced to the physical life. <laughs> this is a forcing to physical life. It's just like. And why there is this risk, Australia thing. Somebody played risk, maybe. Somebody won with playing Australia, maybe. <laughs> uh, because Australia's in the corner. So the other part of boards, of board game boards, we have an end. And the most important parts, most important things happen at the borders. And Australia has only one connection to Asia. 
So you really can fortify Australia and get the two bonus every single turn. And then you can just look the others killing each other and waiting for your moment and win the game, which is, okay, it's an old game. <laughs> it could, I think they're, 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 this was changed uh, not in the new version because Hasbro is still selling this brand and people like it like it is and yeah, as it is. But normally I would say it should be changed. <laughs> so now we come to the very big part of my work. Mechanisms. Of course, I was, I, I was, I was thinking about the tool and my toolbox and yeah, I have a mental toolbox. In that toolbox, there is deck building, worker placement, Pick up and deliver, turn programming, action cards as drawback, turn order manipulation, role selection, and so on and so on. This is all I've seen once, used once. So I can use it to make the decisions in the game. So left corner, there's Agricola. Agricola is a worker placement game. In a worker placement game, you have some workers. It is turn-based, you have spaces, and the space is unique to say when I'm there, you are not there. So, and we have with this turn order, it creates a very interesting structure. I put my worker on that space and the next player reserves another space, the next player reserves another space. So I have to think, okay, I have to place my worker on the most interesting spaces for the others, not the most interesting spaces for me. <laughs> to maybe put my second worker on a very good space for me. And the others can see, so it's, yeah, as you see, it creates something. It creates strategy, it creates, and also it creates the, the structure I like because I can work on it. I can work on the number of, of workers. The number of workers is important, the number of spaces is important. I can allow paying money to the person who is already there to use that space. I can, whatever, make fighting games to fight workers on the working space and we come to a different game, but it is still these, I have my toolbox book of toolbox of standard mechanics, mechanisms, like deck building, worker placement, whatever. But I have the freedom to change everything, just the numbers. There's Fauna. Fauna is already told it's a trivia game where you get a fauna, a, an animal, and you have, to, you have to decide where it's living. And you can not only where, you have, you have to length and weight, but in that example, it's about where you're living, where it is living, and you put a marker on that. And this is structurally worker placement. There's no worker, there's no action. But you have a space where nobody else can go and we have a turn order. And we had a very vital discussion at Board Game Geek about that. And a lot of people say, no, it cannot be worker placement. There's no worker and there's no action. <laughs> so a lot of people say worker placement is a thematic category. For me, not. It's an abstract category. So this is very difficult to tear apart because the worker placement has the word worker in that. So it's just like, feels like it should be about workers <laughs> and not about wooden cubes uh, generating points for a trivia game. But what to say, it's just like, other mechanisms are very good to use. Um, in Power Grid, I use auctions. Auctions have a, for me, a vital thing. I make a lot of business games. I like auctions because they are kind of self-balancing. So if, some, if a good is rare, if the good is a lot of people want it, it gets a higher price. So I can have where I really, where it's really difficult to, to, to have a fixed price in a game, you can in include an auction because it is impossible to set the price because it's kind of in power grid. One power plant is in that turn, it is worth 75, and next turn only 50. It's just, it is from round to round, it's, it happens. So it is impossible to, to have a fixed price on that. So I use it, but non-gamers are scared by auctions. Casual gamers are scared because they don't know what it's worth, they don't know what to pay. So Power Grid is a game non-casual players can play because there's a minimum, minimum bit on it, there is, um, Every round you can only buy one of these power plants and whoever is last has no bidders with him. So he gets or she gets 
this power plant for the minimum bid. So there is a guideline. The game itself shows a guideline for the price. There's a minimum bid and there's a rule, yeah, don't go too high because you will get something for the printed price, for sure. So if you pay double, it's your fault. You have seen it. Don't play du pay double in some situations. Some people pay double and win, but these are special situations in power. <laughs> but not normally, not in a family, not in a casual gamer. And therefore, a lot of people say Power Grid works as a gateway game. Um, because you do what you do. You just buy something, a power plant, you buy resources, you buy cities, and you get money out of it. Oh, again, I put, it, put the money in and do the same. Everybody understands that concept. Even families, even kids. And if there's somebody who has the rules, then everybody can play it. They, might not, they may not win, but they will have fun with the game, they can play it. And therefore, this very interesting um, custom-made, fan-made power grid rack. It's not in the game, somebody made it. This is the auction rack. On top, there's a, the card that's already auctioned, the other things are the available or future available things. So this is the toolbox. And on the other hand, I talked to Uwe Rosenberg, who's designer of Agricola. I discussed with him, is Fauna worker placement or not, because he made these top worker placement. And he said, yeah, for him is this worker placement, but on the other hand, if I use a mechanic, a mechanism, I don't matter how, what it is, the most important part is that the gamers have fun with it. And this is true. <laughs> yeah, you can have a mental toolbox for whatever, but you have to use the things that are fun. So, concepts. What is the difference between a concept and a mechanism? A concept is a superordinated system for the game, and the mechanisms are just the parts. So yeah, maybe this, yeah, whatever. Um, as I started to think about it, what tools are from my, then I, I separated it, and then I found out, hmm, what is a trick-taking game? A trick-taking game, I think you all know trick-taking games as games. There, the concept is a game, and the, the mechanism is, uh, is trick-taking. So, so this is, is hard, because it is both, only because trick-taking games only have one mechanism. So it works as this concept thing. So then we see these concepts in the left corner. There is the concept, my concept, overlying concept for engine building. This game is called Outpost. It's very old. And it's a monster. It's just like, it's long, OK, three, four hours. But it's a monster in that way that it is um, a beast. It's an engine. You get engine means, business-wise, I get money out of the structure, put it back in, get more money out of the structure, put it back in. So this is snowballing, this is snowballing, snowballing, snowballing. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Outpost is, is that. So it is a runaway leader problem with an Outpost. There's everything in there, yeah? But it's also powerful, and therefore I like it. It's just like these, ah, yeah? It is these, every step, it's like step on thin ice. I can just crush and I'm out. I'm, I'm absolutely out, the others run away. Yeah? So every step I really have to. This is not mainstream game design. This is just impossible to play it with kids. And yeah, because you play three and a half hours, and after two turns, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> you're just yeah, falling apart. You can still play with and do some, yeah. I had one game with people not playing so often. And in the end, I tried to have more victory points than the other five in some. Yeah, it's just like they, they got to go into the system and I was just there. I said, yeah, this is not fun for me to play that. I, I try to co compete more. But the same thing is Power Grid is an engine builder. And Power Grid is a very domesticated beast. <laughs> and therefore it's a success. There's rubber bending, there is turn order. The turn order is always pushing the leader in the face. There's a limit of three power plants, which is a very important part of the game. You cannot grow and grow and grow. There's a limit of growing. So in Power Grid, there are so many aspects of balancing it to kill out the runaway leader problem. And therefore, it is, I think we are now at 300,000 sold physical copies, which is a game, and it's still a game from 2004, and still people talk about it. So this is both. It's just a lot of units sold and still 
for that kind of game that old, it is very important that people still talk about it. In the center, there is this um, material list for 504. And we had fun with that because we made percentages of use. <laughs> there are probabilities or percentages of use for each element. You need it in 100% games, you need it only in 2% of the games, you only need, so it was fun to, to add these. Because 504 is only concept. There's no theme, there's no, there's no other inspiration. This is just concept. The concept was, I wanted to make a 504 game, 504 games in one game box generated out of nine mechaniz mechanisms to create 504 different games. And the uh, trick was to take one of the mechanisms to define the victory condition, take the second one to define the economics. So the problem with Outpost is that the, economist, the, the economy and the victory point are connected. Therefore, this is a beast. So if you get more and more money, you get more and more victory points. But if you get an engine where you get more and more money, but you have to put some of the money in your, in your victory point structure, then it is not that snowballing. It's just a trick, and therefore I, just as, uh, and therefore I made it for 504 because for, I think to balance 504 games, it was impossible for me. Yeah, I cannot balance 504 games that each last at least an hour. It's just uh, impossible for the game design process. And the third one is just featuring some flavor. Yeah? So it's very down there. So these are con concepts. There are, uh, there's a racing game, and next to it there's a pad with a pen. Uh, I like the racing better than the pad with a pen. <laughs> um, the racing is just somebody win when he's there, or she's there, when a goal is reached. The pen and the pad is just agricola, it is point salad, it is just when the game ends, after whatever number of turns, we just calculate our victory points. And this is really, in point salad games, a part of the concept. But surprisingly for me, I mainly I only see these two concepts in games. They are only one in board games, in games about I talk about I talk about. It's just the game ends someday and we score the points, or the game ends because somebody has reached a goal or the goal. So therefore I want to say that this is for me a design decision to go one way or another. Normally I do race games. The author really much here of Kalos, which is the underlying worker placement concept of Agricola Uwe Rosenberg used, said to me, I, I don't like your games, I don't like racing games. <laughs> for, for, for him, every game I make is a racing game, and he might be right. Um, the new thing of concepts I see for now in the board game industry and for the future is scripted play. We have legacy games. Legacy games are started with Risk, Risk Legacy and uh, go over to Pandemic Legacy, C4, Pandemic Season 1, 2, 3. Um, it's a game where you really play a campaign, a season. And I do the, did that with Fable Fruit, with my Fast Forward series, therefore these both with pictures are there. Uh, the uh, Pandemic picture is the um, score pad. You have to January to, to December and you write down, you play, you played January, then you'd write down the scores, blah, 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 whatever it is, or in, if you won. If you did not win, the, it's cooperative. So January, you have to play January again. If you win January, you go to February. So you play the complete year in Pandemic Legacy. So it is, it is in the role-playing games, there's the word sandbag boxing or railroading. And this is railroading. It's just like, put it on the track, this game, and go for it and you write on the board and you destroy cards in these legacy games. So after these 12 months, the game is done. You cannot, you can play it, but you will not. <laughs> yeah, it's done. It's just maybe, you, yeah, and there's season two and season three, yeah, there's nobody, why, why would, you, would you look another season one if season two is out of a film or a, a, yeah, movies? I don't know. So it's just like, but this is scripted play, and there are so many aspects. This guided play, this fast forward, is learning the game while playing my concept for this. We played this morning. Um, so guided play is something I think it is for the board games very important because computer games have the advantage of tutorials. We do not have it in board games. 
we have nobody showing us. And we have the problem in board games, if somebody is making something against the rules, yeah, there's no system to stop it. In computer games, it's impossible to click there. In board games, you can just move there, you can just take it. Yeah, it's just like, nobody says, nobody, there is no, <laughs> somebody from above said, Whoa. <laughs> no, it's not there. It's just, this is, a, this is the main problem of, of, of board games, to get people into play. Because they have to read these manual, these ah, manual. So, and uh, because uh, people want to see that, and <laughs> I edit, I use computers, and I use this very nice program, Macromedia Director, for my work. <laughs> uh, I'm old. <laughs> and uh, I learned it, and I, I worked with it, and I found out they made a new version uh, two, two years ago, and I said, why should I learn something new only for simulating? This is a simulation of 504. So I, I, I wrote a simulation of 504, as you see, there's no hex grid, because I used uh, rectangles to simulate the hex grid, because rectangles are easier to program. Um, <laughs> and it's not shiny, it, it don't have to be. It's just like, you have player colors, you see there uh, on the, on the yeah, right-hand side middle, this is the board. The other things are structure from director. This is the, uh, in the center there, this is the board with these rectangles and there's money and the colors, how much money each player has, how much units they have, and there should be units on the board, but this is a starting thing. Therefore, it's Startaufbau. Yeah, it's a starting thing there. Yeah. So this is, I just want to tell that I use the computers to help me to print my files, to print my cards, and to simulate stuff I cannot, like, with the words, you can. You have to iterate stuff to get knowledge. Yeah, this is I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>